Hello everybody, I'm Rene Ramos, director of the Lynn and Lewis Wolfson II Florida Moving Image Archives, and this is Rewind, the show that looks back on Florida's past with historic film and video. It's time for another trip back into the past, so sit back, relax, and enjoy another episode of Rewind. If he had only founded the first television station in the state of Florida, he would be well worthy of remembrance. But the fact that Mitchell Wolfson was a true visionary, civic leader, philanthropist, and television pioneer indelibly writes his name into South Florida and broadcast history. It was 1949. The post-war spirit was alive and well in South Florida. After World War II, America and South Florida had leisure time, and they were enjoying it fact that was not lost on the recently discharged Army Colonel Mitchell Wolfson. It was his military experience that gave him his idea of how he would refocus his career after the war. I uh, served in the American Army in World War II, and uh, after the war was over and I started thinking about what happened, I realized that the way we defeated the Germans was through destroying their communications. The Germans were good soldiers. I think we were just as good, if not a little better, but we were able to destroy their communications. And when I came home, I thought to myself, civilization is going to require communications of all sorts. But of course, communication was newspapers, which you read, and uh, also radio, which you heard, which was popular at that time, both newspapers and radio. And I said, isn't it interesting, we in the motion picture business, with talking pictures, we have a combination of both reading and hearing, like radio and newspapers, and television fits that area of communications very well. And I thought the thing for Wilmetco to do was to get into the television business, because with the type of communications that television would bring to the American people, it would be a very good thing both from a commercial point of view as well as an interesting business to go into. And so we immediately, uh, as soon as we could, uh, we applied for and got into the television business. And within a short period of time, he knew everything there was to know about that business. He had a tremendous capacity to learn. During the Great Depression, to start a movie theater during the Great Depression, is unfathomable. And then the first television in Florida when nobody could afford TVs and there was no programming to speak of in the late 40s, 48, 49 when we signed on WTVJ. Of course, Mitchell Wilson had a leg up on his vision of the future. He was already in the leisure time business. He and soon to be brother-in-law, Sidney Meyer, had formed the Wilson Meyer Theater Company in 1925. That company would go on to found a successful chain of South Florida movie theaters. But what piqued the Colonel's interest in 1949 and what he knew would capture the energy of a booming South Florida was television. But would this new medium be in direct competition with the Colonel's highly successful movie theater business? Uh, I always believe in the old adage that if you can't lick them, join them. And uh, as I said before, since we had experience with talking motion pictures that you saw and you heard, I thought that would be a very good business to complement the motion picture industry. So, at noon on March 21st, 1949, the fewer than 2,000 TV sets in South Florida flickered to life with something other than that annoying, snowy, black and white ash. WTVJ had signed on the air. And this is what South Florida viewers saw for a full seven hours. Not exactly what they'd been waiting for, but at 7 p.m., broadcast history was made. Ralph, that night seems a long time ago. I'm reminded of it by this picture, taken the split second we went on the air in 1949. But I must admit, we didn't realize then the full impact this new medium would have on the community. But WTVJ's impact would soon be felt Along with the anticipation that came with the first day of spring in 1949, came the anticipation of television in South Florida. With only 2,200 watts of power, only a bit more than it takes to power two of today's hair dryers or microwave ovens, 
WTVJ would go on the air as only the 16th TV station in the entire United States. But the journey to Mitchell Wolfson's triumphs didn't start in Miami. It started in Florida's largest city at the turn of the 20th century, Key West. Whether it was a romantic tale of a shipwreck or just the lure of Key West as a welcoming port for Russian Jewish immigrants, Mitchell Wolfson's uncle, Joe Wolfson, would come ashore in 1884 and find Key West to be a good place to drop anchor. So good, in fact, that he brought other family members to this place of promise at the end of the Keys. And his family would grow. And in 1887, Joe's brother, Louis, and his wife, Rosa, came to Key West. Mitchell Wolfson would come into the world with a new century, born to Louis and Rosa Wolfson in Key West on September 13, 1900. He was born a conch, what Key Westers have come to be called after the beautiful conch shells found in the Florida Keys. Even then, young Mitchell was developing his entrepreneurial spirit. I was born down in Key West, Florida. And uh, as you know, it was a port city. And uh, we were always afraid of some of the foreign ships that came in there might bring in uh, different diseases. And there was once, uh, when I was a young, very young fellow, maybe eight, nine, 10 years old, there was a great hue and cry that one of the ships had brought in the Blue Blonic Plague. And the uh, health authority says this could be transmitted by way of rodents, rats, if you'll excuse this uh, very uh, down to earth expression. And so they said they would give 10 cents for every rat that was captured that was brought to the health authority. And I got me a number of traps and set up traps and bars and restaurants around town and I used to make you know, a dollar, dollar a quarter a day by bringing in 10, 15 rats, which uh, was my first job that I ever made any money with. Mitchell Wolfson would eventually give up his extermination business for his father's clothing business and work at their store of fashion on Duval Street in Key West with his brothers, William and Phil and sister Xenia. Lewis gave Mitchell his first lessons in civic pride and responsibility serving on the Key West City Council. He also gave him a piece of advice. Mitchell, remember, you can't grow a crop every year unless you put something back in the soil. That advice of putting something back would never leave him. Always gave back to the community and always taught others, including in the philosophy of Wameco itself, to give back to your community. Grow your community and we'll all grow upon it. His parents, thinking Mitchell needed an education with a larger perspective, sent him to live with his brother William in Brooklyn, New York, to attend high school and college. But he would return to Florida during World War I. Rosa and Louis, his parents, um, actually wanted him back in Key West. Um, and so he left New York and uh, came to Key West and never graduated. And I think he always uh, uh, kept that in mind and felt that was something that uh, he would have given anything to uh, achieve, but he didn't have a degree. He got many honorary degrees afterwards, but he didn't have a, a degree from Columbia where he would have gone. So I think that stayed with him, the importance of education. By now, the Wilson family had moved to expand their East Coast wholesale corporation. So, in 1918, Mitchell would return to work as a salesman in his father's clothing and shoe business, this time in downtown Miami. But he would never forget his Key West roots. It was Mitchell's sister, Xenia, who would next change Mitchell Wilson's path. Her soon-to-be husband, Sidney Meyer, and his connections in the movie industry would help Mitchell achieve his next true vision. At the age of 25, Mitch and Sid would form the Wolfson Meyer Theater Company. And on Friday night, June 26, 1926, after a year of construction, they attended opening night at their palatial Capitol Theater at 300 North Miami Avenue in downtown Miami. The 1500 First Nighters may not have found the feature The Midnight Sun as memorable as the rudimentary air conditioning that kept the theater comfortable and offered sanctuary from a Miami summer night's heat. 1926 would also be the year that Pensacola's Francis Lewis Cohen, a fourth-generation Floridian, would marry Mitchell Wolfson. The marriage would last over half a century, 
until her death in 1980. The couple had three children, Louis II, Francis, and Mitchell Jr. From the Capitol Theater's success, it was a succession of owning and operating more theaters throughout South Florida. Through the years, Mitchell Wilson, entrepreneur, would make an impact on Miami in the business world and as a public servant. Starting in 1939, he ran for public office three times and was clearly good at it, winning in all three elections. In 1943, he would become Mayor Mitchell Wilson when the people of Miami Beach elected him to lead their growing city. He was fascinated by politics, and thus he went into politics, and he became the mayor of a city. But um, he, he realized how difficult that was and how um, hard that was to achieve, I think, what his ambitions um, were. So it was too slow a process. And so um, he used um, business as, a, as a, uh, a way of exchange of ideas and um, how to influence in deal making. He was very good. And that challenge, I think, uh, stimulated him. Then, World War. As so many did, Mitchell Wilson would step down from serving his community so he could step up to serving his country. Wilson resigned his mayoral position and enlisted in the U.S. Army, where visions of his future and ours would come into focus. I really didn't know my father until after the war. Dramatically speaking, if you will, um, I had no father until after he came back. And it must have been the most heart-rendering experience for him because when my mother went down to Greenville or Spartanburg um, to pick him up, and uh, he came back to the house in Asheville. Um, he arrived early in the morning and my mother brought him in and said, oh, Mickey, this is your father. And I said, oh, that's fantastic. Well, I, I don't know him, but I guess I'll get used to him. And what was he? He was born in 1900 and he was already um, 40 or 41 years old. And so when he went into the army, he went in as a major and uh, he came out as a lieutenant colonel. And he received, the highest award he received, I think, was the French uh, Croix de Guerre. Um, but he was, a, um, he was a, a lieutenant colonel, and thus the, um, thus the colonel. He demanded authority, and really, it, um, it, I called him the colonel as much as I called him Pops. The Colonel's vision of bringing television to Florida could not have been timed any better. As WTVJ signed on the air in 1949, there was a curious and hungry audience ready and waiting. Here's a sample of some of the specials you'll find right now at King Oldsmobile. First, this Broadcasting in the earliest days from a 22 by 38 foot studio and a 306 foot antenna at Miami's Everglades Hotel, WTVJ aired only two hours of programming a day from 7 to 9 p.m. And even with that abbreviated schedule, the station was dark, off the air, on Tuesday nights. But by the end of 1949, WTVJ would be broadcasting 48 hours a week to an appreciative audience. But a television station needs more than a viewing audience. It needs paying sponsors. And by the end of 1949, WTVJ would have an amazing 265 clients who saw and believed in Mitchell Wilson's vision of television. Key to Wilson's vision was community service and a stellar news department that would give the news station credibility and respect. It was at this time in WTVJ's infancy that the Colonel would find a tall, thin University of Miami grad who would head up his news department. Of course, when Mr. Rennick came along, it was a marriage made in heaven because that way, um, um, Ralph, as the uh, agent and the person that could articulate um, the thoughts, um, were, it was a perfect uh, um, um, twosome because um, my father could express himself to, to Ralph and Ralph could transmit these thoughts, um, edit them in part, and transmit them coherently 
to a much larger public than my father could have ever reached. Um, the only th way he could reach public like that was in deal making, um, in um, orchestrating um, uh, uh, business deals, financial deals, and in expressing his political, social, civic, um, even cultural sometimes views uh, th through wealth. Colonel Wilson was one man who had had a long range of experience in motion pictures and knowing what people wanted for entertainment and information. And uh, he was very far-sighted enough to realize the value of a television station in terms of not only pleasing an audience, but in terms of providing information and editorials and discussion and basic facts that would help to move the community forward. And that was about the time I first came in contact with him. I had just finished up at the University of Miami, and he gave me the opportunity back in 1949 to become affiliated with Channel 4 in the development of news for Florida's first station. And those were very pioneering days in news also. A one-man news staff, uh, namely myself, uh, who shot the film and uh, developed it and aired the program, and we grew from that point. The colonel loved Ralph to begin with, and he, Ralph was his focus as far as the television station was concerned, and Ralph was his appearance in the community, and he always wanted to make sure that the community saw us through Ralph. You know, Ralph Rennick built television in South Florida, put the station on the map, put the everything, and he loved Rennick. And if you said anything negative, you were in deep trouble with Mr. Wolfson. We can never stop Americans from struggling to be free. We can never stop Americans from hoping and praying that someday, in some way, this ideal that is embedded in our Declaration of Independence is one of those truths that are inevitable that all men are created equal. And Rennick, South Florida's first anchorman. Ralph's 36 years of delivering the news on camera made him the longest running anchor in TV history, all accredited to the vision of Mitchell Wilson. The station's fewer than two dozen employees at its 1949 sign-on had grown to 122 by 1951. During the same period, TV households exploded from 2,200 to more than 34,000. Programming, though, was still limited to station-generated shows or kinescopes, live shows recorded on film, delivered physically to the station from the CBS, NBC, ABC, and Dumont networks. These shows could be a month old by the time WTVJ received and aired them. At the time, WTVJ was not affiliated with any one network, but that would change. In July of 1952, Columbia Broadcasting System's coaxial cable connection was completed to Miami. That opened WTVJ to New York and the world. The Colonel's decision to carry the CBS network exclusively wasn't difficult for him. CBS was simply the first network to supply live programming to the Miami market. Still, it was a good decision because even then, CBS was becoming the Tiffany network. So. On that July night in 1952, for the first time, Miami viewers would see the same CBS shows in their living rooms that viewers in the rest of the CBS network markets were seeing in their living rooms. The CBS Summer Theater became the first live network television transmission seen in Miami. Mitchell Wolfson had again given the people what they wanted. WTVJ had outgrown its original Everglades Hotel digs by now, so what was once the jewel in the Wolfson Meyer Theater Company, the Capitol Theater, was refitted to become a jewel of another kind, a broadcast jewel. 316 North Miami Avenue in downtown Miami became WTVJ's new home and corporate headquarters in November of 1952. And by the eve of the new year, WTVJ was sending the world the first live pictures of the King Orange Bowl Parade, direct from Biscayne Boulevard. Happy New Year! And so continued the long list of WTVJ firsts that had been created by Colonel Wolfson's vision. 1949, the country's first mobile TV facility. 1950, the country's first Orange Bowl game, broadcast live. 1950, the country's first network broadcast from the Goodyear blimp. 
1951, South Florida's first undercover report. 1951, the country's first achievement award from the News Directors Association for reporting. 1952, the country's first recipient of the Radio and Television News Directors Association's Outstanding News Organization Award. 1957, the country's first underwater remote. 1957, South Florida's first to report on state government from Tallahassee. 1957, the country's first daily television editorial. 1957, South Florida's first kids show, Popeye Playhouse. 1960, the country's first English language station to broadcast a news show in Spanish. 1962, South Florida's first Broward County Bureau. 1967, the country's first female TV sportscaster. 1968, South Florida's first African-American TV journalist. 1974, South Florida's first TV station to advance to videotape for news gathering. 1975, South Florida's first live mobile field report. In 1954, the Colonel made it official when he signed the agreement to make WTVJ an affiliate of the Columbia Broadcasting System, a clearly eye-opening experience. And by the next year, CBS would increase network programming to 26 hours a week. With that new programming, equivalent to what a network offers its affiliates in only two days today, came more reasons for more people to want WTVJ in their homes. So. A new 1,000-foot tower was built in Hallandale, Florida. And on Monday, May 17, 1954, the tower changeover was made, allowing WTVJ to reach into 16 Florida counties, from Fort Pierce to the Keys and Fort Myers to Nassau. As he'd done with his theaters, Colonel Mitchell Wilson would also do with his television station by giving the people what they wanted. He would also give sponsors what they wanted, at an affordable cost. We've stayed in the leisure time business with all kinds of communications, particularly with the theory that we would sell goods and services which were expendable. Once you saw them, you, you wanted to use them again. If you wanted to see a picture or you wanted to see a television show, you'd have to look at it again. Of course, you'd have to pay for it again if you went to the movies and that type of thing is what we've always kept in mind and we only go into businesses which are reasonable in price. In the mid-1950s, the Wolfson Meyer Theater Company would become Wometco Enterprises, and the Colonel's vision of creating a leisure time company flourished. In 1955, the Colonel added to the holdings of Wometco Enterprises, the oldest oceanarium in the United States, a Miami Seaquarium, as the first of what would be many tourist attractions. But not all of what the Colonel did was in the name of business, after years of decline, the 19th century Key West home of Captain John Geiger was to be demolished. In an act of giving back, Francis and Mitchell Wilson purchased and renovated the old home in 1958. Jesse Porter Newton said they're going to tear down the Audubon house. The, the, it was called the Geiger home back then. Francis, they're going to tear it down with a wrecking ball. You've got to save it. It has too much history. He was a harbor pilot of Key West Harbor, a lot of history since the 1850s when that house was built. You got to save it. Well, she bought it, unbeknownst to the colonel. And now they had to restore it. And it was a wreck. It should have been knocked down and rebuilt. But it sparked the restoration movement. Three years later, they opened it up to the public. We maintain it as a, a historical home today, open to the public. And uh, the colonel was going to kill her. It was just more money they could have ever imagined in a lifetime, and it still is today, to maintain an 1850s home. But it really was an amazing thing that she did for the entire city of Key West, from the Hemingway House to the Little White House. Key West wouldn't be what it is today had it not been for Francis Wolfson. So Mitch Wolfson buys it, cleans it up, spends $60,000 on it to turn it into a real nice thing. The city says, no, we don't want it. You're going to have to run it as a museum. So all of a sudden now we're in the museum business. 
Now known as the John James Audubon House, it holds a collection of the famous naturalist's paintings said to have been inspired by Audubon's visit to Key West and this home in 1932. This generous act spurred an entire historic district renovation in Key West of the 1960s. Later, the Colonel would say it was that restorative act and what it started in Key West as one of his finest accomplishments. He never forgot his conch beginnings. In January of 1959, WTVJ scooped the nation by being first on the ground in Cuba after the government takeover and first to interview then unknown rebel leader Fidel Castro. Are you looking forward to shaving off your beard or do you intend to keep it? In 1959, the Colonel's company would go public. Wometco stock would be offered to the public and traded on the big board, the New York Stock Exchange. It was a natural disaster that proved the real need for a quality local television station. In 1960, WTVJ brought Hurricane Donna with warnings and information, which most certainly saved property and lives. Wometco Enterprises would continue to expand throughout the 60s, 70s, and 80s, both in size and in thinking. No longer would television be a white, male-exclusive medium. In 1967, WTVJ debuted the country's first female sportscaster, Jane Chastain. And the next year, WTVJ hired C.T. Taylor as South Florida's first on-air African-American reporter. Both firsts occurred on the progressive watch of Mitchell Wolfson. And in 1977, the Colonel once again looked into the future and pioneered a nationwide subscription television service called Wometco Home Theater. Under the Colonel's half-century of leadership, Wometco's banner would fly over 45 movie theaters, five television stations, 47 cable TV systems, a vending machine division, one of the largest Coca-Cola bottlers in the nation, the Miami Aquarium, the Florida Citrus Tower, and other popular attractions. A true leisure time conglomerate with a true responsible leader. And I like to say to people when they ask me, are you a liberal or are you a conservative? I like to very emphatically say I'm neither. I'm responsible. Colonel Mitchell Wilson, president of Wometco, often said, I'd rather wear out than rust out. And so it was. In 1983, the Colonel wore out. At his pinnacle, he had grown one downtown Miami theater into a nationwide top 500 publicly traded leisure time company with more than 8,000 employees. He'd followed his father's advice to give back so the crops would continue to grow. And his presence is still giving back to his community today and giving back in wonderfully significant ways. He was one of the founders of the Miami-Dade College. In fact, the downtown location bears his name, Miami-Dade College Wolfson Campus. And fittingly, it's only two blocks from the site of his original Capitol Theater. He was involved in starting the community college and he, um, he put a lot of his uh, passion into that, too. And 80% um, of his estate is, goes toward the community college. And every year, I give almost $10 million a year to the community college. And we've given out of his estate now enough money to give scholarships to over 50,000 kids that have gotten educated at the community college. And he would be, I think he'd be very proud of that. The Colonel wanted people to have the opportunity to compete and to obtain and hold jobs. And he felt the best way to do that was through education. In fact, a portion of the mission statement of Miami-Dade College says to change lives through the opportunity of education. Through the years, the Mitchell Wolfson Senior Foundation has given back too, with contributions of more than $100 million for scholarships and academic support of Miami-Dade College. Visionary, civic leader, philanthropist, and television pioneer, Colonel Mitchell Wolfson is still giving people what they want.